live. This is the Jeff Santos Show on the Revolution Radio Network. Rebuilding America together. Now, here's Jeff. 33 minutes past the hour. It is the Jeff Santos Show that you are tuned into. We're going to be talking with our good friend uh, Mark Taylor Canfield coming up in a in a few minutes. So, you know, next week we're going to have Galen White on to talk about Field of Dreams, uh, actually a game not far from the original uh, movie set in uh, Dyersville, Iowa, uh, between the White Sox and the hated Yankees. You know who I'm rooting for. Go Chicago, go. Um, but um, even more important is a way to, you know, kind of go back to the, to the, to the roots of baseball. Uh, you know, starting in the cities, starting in the rural areas, and uh, it's, uh, it's so great. We're going to be following that, and great, great baseball historian Galen White on that uh, next week. I believe the game is on Thursday night on Fox TV. We'll uh, get into that a little bit uh, later in the week and so forth. Uh, athletes, entertainers, musicians, they all have a, a very powerful, powerful uh, platform to state about the COVID-19, and I think they should. All right, speaking of musicians, he's one. He's a great investigative journalist, Democracy Watch News, and he is a, uh, a fantastic activist uh, there in the great city of Seattle. It's a great time to talk to our good friend. And Mark Taylor Canfield joins us on the line from the 206. Happy Friday, Mark. <laughs> Welcome to the best talk show in the country, folks. I keep telling people that. Uh, that this is the best show. Uh, by the way, it's cloudy in Seattle, and I'm not lying just to uh, keep people from moving here. Not that many people could afford to move here anyway. But yes. we're excited to see the rain in the forecast because we're having our own forest fire season. And we've definitely had some overcast days. But I want to tell you, last night I was at an Art Walk photography show by photographer Karen Blair at the iconic Central Tavern where all the famous grunge bands have played, and I've performed in the past. Um, also saw some crazy punk shows there. But Karen Blair was on the scene way back in the day to photograph Eddie Vedder and Pearl Jam, Nirvana, Soundgarden, uh, while they were playing you know, in the local clubs in Seattle, just getting their start. And the band that influenced all those groups was called Mother Love Bone, which was fronted by Andy Wood. And that guy really inspired Kurt Cobain. If you wonder where Kurt got the idea for the crazy sunglasses, look at pictures of Andy Wood. But, well, there you uh, go. The that makes a lot of the, sense. The, yeah, the Temple of the Dog album featured a lot of those grunge guys, and they dedicated that album to Andy Wood because he influenced so many of them. And I'm proud to say that I have a signed print of a Mother Love Bone photograph from Karen Blair, and I'm really psyched about that. It's going into my recording studio right next to my friend poster, Jimi Hendrix, to inspire me. Um, and speaking of bands, Dave Grohl and the Foo Fighters just renewed their public dispute with Westboro Baptist Church in Kansas, where the band is now touring, and they buzzed the church while performing a Bee Gees song from a flatbed truck um, on a video that has gone viral now. And by the way, Westboro Baptist Church, I, it's, not, it's not Reverend Phelps, but the, the Southern Poverty Law Center calls that church uh, one of the biggest hate groups in the country because they're so militantly and militantly anti-gay. So Dave and the band are holding the torch for tolerance in this country, and that's a very good thing. I wish more band that musicians is a great thing. would be activists that way. We, we would have a better society. I'm excited to get out on stage, but we're still being very cautious here because, unfortunately, a few local bars had to close temporarily again due to COVID popping up among their staff. So we're not out of the woods yet, but I'm very hopeful that by early next year, it'll be safe to be on Seattle uh, stages again. And part of the issue here is that if you are vaccinated, and I know folks who still tested positive, even though they were vaccinated, even though their symptoms were very slight, they still had to be in quarantine for 14 days. That's and right. I currently have a close friend who was exposed to somebody on Friday, so he is now in quarantine for 14 days. And then quickly, the Americans with non-essential jobs will now be allowed to enter Canada starting in a few days, but you will have to show proof of vaccination, and they're going to test you right there at the border before they let you in. So that's the, crowd, the status of the cross-border travel here. But the ferries and the greyhounds are still not prepared to cross the border. So we'll see where that goes, Jeff. But that's the report from Seattle. This is Mark Canto live from the MTC. <laughs> <laughs> With the scoop, um, MTC, uh, talk, talk to me a little bit about what is the COVID scene in Seattle. Of course, we all know that one of the first cities to be hit hard uh, through the nursing homes there uh, was Seattle. 
Um, and you're, you're, what you're telling me now is, is it is come to the, again, young people are the ones that are really in danger here because a lot of them believe they're invincible. A lot of them believe that it's, uh, you know, that it's, it's not uh, uh, enough uh, ev- evidence to them to get vaccinated. It, uh, Seattle's a pretty progressive, pretty uh, uh, open-minded, well-educated population. Uh, you know, whether you're, you're working for Microsoft or, or Amazon or any other company for that matter, uh, you know, you probably have a, a four year college degree. You, you probably have, uh, you know, some information uh, sim- systems, systems that you, you go through to get information. Hopefully they're, they're, you know, reading Mark Taylor Canfield and listening to the Jeff Santos show. But I, I really feel that, you know, there is an opportunity here uh, to, to sort of take the lead. Uh, we're, and, and Seattle has done that in so many areas. I really hope that, you know, if you are shutting down, you know, uh, bars and restaurants and so forth, that people will come out, um, owners of these restaurants, and say, look, if you want to come in here, you know, and uh, folks in New York have talked about this, Meyer and so forth, that obviously got de Blasio, who's leaving, you know, on a sour taste with progressives and his policies, uh, that, you know, you have to show um, a proof that you've been vaccinated and uh, you're not going to be hired unless you can show proof of vaccination. I think that's where everybody should go. How popular would that be? And again, a very open-minded, very progressive city of Seattle. Well, of course, there are a lot of people moving to Seattle now from other parts of the country who may mm-hmm. not be quite as progressive and are not as familiar with our culture here. Um, so, you know, a lot of them are working for giant corporations like Amazon and you know, so you have some of that. There are also more conservative areas of Martin Luther King Jr. County, uh, which are actually, you know, populated by Republicans who may not agree, you know, with Governor yeah, that's James for sure. these, um health directives. So right now, um, those clubs that I mentioned, um, they close temporarily um, of their own accord, but that it's also in um, keeping with the, the health restrictions. Is that, you know, if you have an employee uh, that had test positive, then they definitely, you know, shut down. Um, so that's what's happened there. I've actually um, been less, I, I have not covered this story as much as I have the elections here. And also, and we can talk about this at some other time, but um, there's a major uprising amongst construction workers and carpenters here in Seattle. Uh, so I've been covering some uh, major rallies they've been having at the Associated General Contractors of Washington State Headquarters because they don't feel that the AGC or the, even their own union are representing their own best interests right now. And they're telling me that you know, they work in Seattle, but they can't afford to live here, and that's a problem. So they really need yes, some wage increases. And they're causing a ruckus. They're out in the streets doing total, total independent rallies. We interviewed one of the organizers for Democracy Watch News yesterday, so they're shaking cages even in their own union, saying we really need to get better business agents and clear up all this stuff where uh, the union management is making hundreds of thousands of dollars while these carpenters, like I said, can't afford to live in the very city that they work. So that's just a shame. I mean, look what's happening to the working class even in a city like Seattle. So there you go. It's a, it's a very interesting time to live here. And as a musician, you know, I am not performing out um, to big crowds right now. And... I love the, the fact that um, some people are out there doing that. Um, my particular band, we, are, we would rather just spend more time in the studio <laughs> for right now and rehearsals and just getting really good at what we do. But, you know, I do, I do support some of the local art and uh, music events in Seattle. I just try to go to ones where there's some sense of social distancing, and that's kind of the way I've been dealing with it. Uh, talking with our good friend Mark Taylor Canfield here on the Jeff Santo Show. you got a mayor's race going there. As we uh, reported uh, that you uh, scooped the world there, uh, that Bernie Sanders has endorsed uh, Ms. Gonzalez. So I- I- yeah. is this going to help um, uh, Ms. Gonzalez to, uh, to victory? She, you know, won along with the other candidate. Uh, how does that uh, portend uh, from your perspective? Is progressive going to come out for her? Well, we had a slate of candidates, our very progressive city attorney, Pete Holmes, was also running for re-election. We had Teresa Mesqueda, who I think position number eight on the city council, she was endorsed by Bernie Sanders. She won handily um, in the primary, so she's definitely going on. 
Pete Holmes has got a challenger because a lot of the the, the money business interests here think he's too soft on crime, and you know he basically dropped all charges against for cannabis convictions when he became city attorney. I told the story where he was the second person in line uh, at the first legal pot shop when it opened in Seattle. He and our state representative Mar- Marlon Chase um, were the first two people in line, and I was right next to them. And Pete was showing off his marijuana to people, saying what a great thing he thought it was. And actually got in trouble when he took it back to the city attorney's office because it was supposed to be a drug-free zone. Um, But he definitely, you know, has been pro-cannabis and and for dropping a lot of, uh, you know, just minor misdemeanors and things like that. Um, As far as the mayor's race goes, yes, Lorena Gonzalez got Bernie Sanders' endorsement. And I think that was a huge thing for her. But surprisingly... If you look at where the money has come from and uh, the votes, Bruce Harrell uh, is the other person. This is a, the top two. This is a runoff of the top two candidates in the primary. Get to move on to the general election in November. Bruce Harrell um, actually uh, is right there neck and neck with uh, Lorena Gonzalez. In fact, he's raised more money. Um, it looks like he's got more money from out of state and things like that. So I have a feeling that he is the sort of um, hand-picked centrist candidate for the business community and maybe some of the more corporate people in the Democratic Party. Lorena Gonzalez, however, um, is probably much more likely to be a mover and shaker and get things done in the city. For one thing, she's the present uh, president. She's the current president of the Seattle City Council. She has a good relationship um on that council and having a mayor who actually gets along with the city council would be a new thing for Seattle where it's usually a very adversarial relationship. And so there are hopes amongst progressives that, um, you know, she can win and really consolidate the power, um, on the city council as well to work with her on trying to end homelessness and reform the police department, which are the two major issues, um, at every event this year. Those have, those have been the issues that have been discussed. And so, Bruce Hill, more of a central, centrist candidate, he actually was in the interim mayor at one point, I believe when um, that was um, when Murray stepped down. So he also has been president of the council. And um, I was also pr- surprised, Jeff, that uh, Colleen Echohawk, member of the Pawnee Nation, she actually came in, I think, third because um, didn't get as much out, out of state money now, we do have the democracy voucher system here where each one of us, as a registered voter, is given $100, and there's public financing for the campaign. But they can also go outside of that, which is often, you know, the case in state and federal elections, too, where uh, people try to uh, publicly finance and limit the amount of uh, campaign money that's being spent. But then, you know, they go out of state or they get big um, awards from their own parties and things like that, and, pri- you know, private people invest a lot of money. So he supplied, um, Bruce, there's $3.2 million that has been raised already in this campaign, and Bruce got the majority uh, uh, more than anybody else um, at this point. So Colleen Echohawk, she's not going to be there for the general election, and I was really surprised by that because she was uh, came out of the starting gate ahead of everyone else, had the most organized campaign, was way ahead of everyone, and, and ahead of Lorita Gonzalez in terms of organizing her campaign, had... I think 40 community meetings all over the city. But, you know, she's a newcomer. She's never held public office before. And if I read the primary voters' intentions from this um, latest election, they were looking for someone who has had experience in public office before, both of which Lorena Gonzalez, who's a former civil rights attorney, and Bruce Harrell have. Bruce has been on the city council and uh, right. forever. I mean, yeah. he's been around forever. Let me uh, let me ask you. Talking with our good friend Mark Taylor Canfield here on the Jeff Santos Show, um, I know that um, you've spoken about this on Twitter and so forth. But uh, you know there there are a lot of uh, uh, sisters, I think, in arms with with Nina Turner and uh, her loss. Uh, what repercussions does it have in Seattle? Um, you know, obviously Bernie Sanders still very strong there and so forth. Any thoughts on? So we were talking about it with. Uh, with that good friend Harvey K and Alan Minsky a little bit earlier, uh, what what effect, if, if any, does it have in Seattle? 
only the only effect it would have is that you know people. She is uh, Nina was very popular here, and I'm you know just, just love hearing her on your show. I, I think she's somebody that people supported here in Seattle. But we are focused on our own local politics and these issues we're having, um, fighting this kind of corporate takeover that's been happening here. And I think uh, Lorena Gonzalez and Bruce Harrell are seen as the most competent candidates running. Now, Echo Hawk, you can bet that she'll be back. I expect to see her to run for office again now that, you know, she got her feet wet in this election. Um, and then Bruce, by the way, I like him personally, but he might represent a more neoliberal kind of policy uh, on some of these issues that, so far, as far as I can tell, have failed to address, you know, homelessness and the reform of the police department the way it should. So he's trying to please both the progressives and the more conservative business interests. And I don't know, he may end up being the kind of candidate that n nobody likes, you know, if he gets elected. I, I don't know. His response to homelessness... Uh, as I said in a text, he was about public safety and window dressing, and he doesn't want the encampments, so he probably would support sweeps. Um, but he's seen as a centrist. He got the Seattle Times endorsement, which was seen as a kind of more centrist or, you know, conservative um, voice in the community. And I think that, you know, it's a battle once again between the the more traditional corporate neoliberal and the progressives in the city, and it's always been that way. It's been going on forever, um, and I think, really, uh, if Gonzalez is elected, she, even her, you know, I said, in, in terms of her comparison to Colleen Echohawk as the candidate for mayor, I said, you know, Lorena has been there, and I've testified before her and talked to her, and, you know, she's seen me many times at council meetings, and so we have this working relationship, but... I haven't seen a huge change in Seattle since she became president of the council. I haven't seen the homelessness, um, the, the increase in homelessness slow down. I haven't seen uh, a, the reforms of the police department that a lot of the Black Lives Matter activists have been calling for. I'm glad that she got Bernie's endorsement, um, Lorena Gonzalez, but you know, I wrote about this at Daily Coast. I think... The, the biggest, the best sign is for Seattle politics is probably the fact that Nikita Oliver in District Number 8 um, uh, handily defeated her opponents, and one of them was backed by more conservative business interests. She is very left of center, I would say. Nikita Oliver is a poet and an educator and very outspoken, very huge supporter of the Black Lives Matter movement, has a lot of respect amongst the Black Lives Matter activists that I talk to. So I'm, you know, I'm looking for her to be the next sort of Shama Sawan on the city council. And between the two of the, those two women, um, both women of color, I think, you know, there will be some uh, some moving and shaking going on. And I'm hoping that that might lead towards some kind of effort to get some real rent control in Seattle. Part of the reason that the carpenters and construction workers can't afford to live here is the high cost of real estate. So no rent control in a city where people are getting their rents increased all the time uh, a friend of mine just called the other day and said yeah my rent's going up six hundred dollars in one month you know that's totally typical in seattle sometimes they double and there needs to be some kind of restrictions on that if we can't get a full-on rent control due to statewide uh restrictions on that because of state legislation then at least the city can do things like force landlords to give people six months notice or something so that it doesn't happen overnight because you know how many people can suddenly increase their income by 25 percent or something in one day that's just not going to happen for a lot of folks and now that the eviction um, moratorium has been lifted and the student debt moratorium and um locally here the eviction moratorium will be lifted next month you know you're, you're facing you know you're going to have these landlords that are just going to want to jack up their rent so high and with no kind of with, with complete unbridled capitalism right like no no regulation whatsoever and that just is not going to wash you, you can't sustain a culture like that you know what is seattle just going to no. become a city for doctors lawyers and yeah you know, it's exactly it's going to be the it's going to be the one percent and everybody else and uh, everybody else is going to have to live outside the city uh just a couple of minutes left here with our good friend uh, mark taylor canfield um you know 
Corey Bush did something very heroic over the last week, uh, camping out uh, on the uh, on the Capitol steps on the eviction issue, which of course resonated nationwide. Uh, and even though Nina was a uh, was a, a tough loss for a lot of progressives, I thought that what she did, and Corey Bush, and and putting this uh, coalition together, that included Biden and Schumer and others, to me was a great example of uh, what progressives can do when they lead, and particularly those who understand what it's like to be homeless, what it's like to be uh, poor, uh, and 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 dealing with uh, being a single mom and all these things. I think that you know she's she has a, a tremendous future, and I and I, I think that uh, you know she would be uh, a great uh, a great candidate for for Senate and so forth, and who knows one day uh, maybe even uh, for president. I, I was uh, thoroughly impressed. I'm not sure how much news it got out there, but to me that's a, that's a perfect example, um, and um, hopefully we can um, we can move in that direction. Uh, well, you know, I was going to tell you really quickly, I interviewed Horter Torfesen, who was the part of that uh, peaceful revolution that took place in, in Iceland a few years ago, and it started with him refusing to leave the parliament building. He just sat outside and had his sign and said, you know, we need change and we need to reform the banking system and all that, and he refused to go. And he said that there were some days when he was the only person there, but within a year or so, you had hundreds and then thousands of people there. And it did change their government. So sometimes it just takes one small step by one individual or one very courageous, you know, public political representative. I'd like to see more of that. I know uh, we have some here in the Northwest, and, you know, I'm, I think that'll continue. But we need to see that on a national level as well. There's just way too much instruction going on in the U.S. Congress. We need to get something done for the people. Amen to that. Hey, before we go, uh, Kraken, our, our tickets are going on sale. Uh-huh. They're going like, uh, like firecrackers, huh? Oh, yeah. Um, there, you know, I haven't checked recently, but I had some friends who said, you know, I'm, you know, I will be the first person buying them. And so even preseason tickets, they're so excited about it. And some, it, some of those folks are from other parts of the country where, you know, they're used to hockey and they've moved here. And, you know, we're kind of disappointed that all, all we had was the minor league team, you know, nothing against their, you know, because they had uh, $10 tickets, which was amazing. You know, it's like two, two for 20 or something like that. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's, they're going to be popular. It's the new kid in town. Everybody's yeah. excited about it. And we had some major sports figures who are uh, really well respected in the city um, helping introduce them. You know, Yeah, and I saw Lenny Seattle. Wilkins and, uh, and and Russ Wilson and others as well. And, of course, Wilson yeah. comes from Wisconsin, a big hockey town, too. So uh, there you go. Hey, Mark, uh, thank you, my friend. Have yourself a great weekend. Uh, we will uh, talk to you next Friday. Uh, enjoy it, my man. Uh, all the best. Thanks, Mark. Check out my stuff at YouTube and Instagram and Facebook. Take, take the music, everybody. Have a good weekend. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Uh, you do the uh, you do the same. I want to thank uh, Ron Carter for producing this broadcast. Thank you, folks, for uh, listening in today. Uh, keep on fighting peacefully. Have yourself a wonderful weekend. Right now, my name is Jeff Santos, and it is my time to say I got to go. A happy weekend, and I tell you to be safe wherever you are. My name is Jeff Santos, and it is my time to say I got to go.